How you guys doing? You good? I love you guys. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. They say not to be biased when you go speak places. I love liberty. That's just how it is. You guys are awesome. Um, okay, let's see here. I don't have that much time. So if you have your Bibles, Genesis 1 for me. Um, now the book obviously uh, comes out today. And I was going to speak on Luke 15. When I go and speak about the book, that's what I'll use, the text I'll use for pretty much every other place I speak in about the book, because that was kind of what impacted me. That was the essence of the book and kind of what made me start seeing the differences and what Jesus was trying to get after when he came um, 2,000 years ago. But I was was doing some research on, on Liberty Convo, and last year, within the last year, you guys have had two people already do Luke 15. Their names are Judah Smith and Mark Driscoll, which if you know are also from where I'm from. And so I was like, I'm not going to be the third Seattle guy that does that text. I'm just not going to do it, okay? Um, And especially because those are world-class preachers. I don't want to try to step into those shoes. So with that being said, this is a message that I have put together for you guys. I don't know how it's going to go, if that makes sense, because it's kind of new. It's kind of fresh. It's kind of raw. The best way to explain it is... Some messages are like snipers, you know? We have any Call of Duty fans here? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. But, you know, some messages are like snipers, meaning you have one point and you're just trying to drive that thing home. I would say this one's more like a grenade, meaning I'm just going to lob it. Some might get some shrapnel in your flesh. Some might not. You might leave and say, that was weird. What was he trying to do there? And like I said, some might get hit. Some might not. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to try to go with it. And if you leave with something cool, if you don't, I'm sorry. I love you. I'll apologize later. Um, Genesis 1. Now, the question I kind of want to chat about today is, I think we zoom in on the parts of the scripture too much and we miss the story. Does that make sense? We miss this kind of this overarch, this arc, this narrative of what Jesus is doing, what kind of the narrative of the scripture is. And so two questions I want to look at first. The first is, do we really get what intimacy means? And then the question is, do we know what God's after? Do we know what God's after? What's his point? What's he driving towards? Where is he going? And the question is, on top of that, do we follow him in what he's doing? Do we kind of join in and say, we get what he's doing, and then we're in. We're in with what he is doing. Now, the question, we have some intro work I want to do. The question I want to ask you guys is, it's a weird question, but it's just what I ask myself. That's just how it's going to be. Okay. Are you a Genesis 1, or are you a Genesis 3 Christian? That's a weird question, is it not? You're like, what does that even mean? Think about that for a second. Are you a Genesis 1, or are you a Genesis 3 Christian? What I mean by that is, where do you start the story? When you tell people about Jesus, where do you start? Do you start in Genesis 1? where you see creation, you see the image of God, you see shalom, as the Hebrews used to say, which means kind of this rhythm, this peace, this this functionality of everyone, everything working how it's supposed to work. You see God declare in Genesis 1 that he what? It says he creates something and he declares that it was good. That's fascinating. That's really fascinating. He doesn't say, well, day three was secular, day four is sacred. Does he say that? No, he says it was good. Food, politics, art, culture, music, sexuality for Pete's sake. That is good. That's God's idea. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he created sexuality and he declared it was good, right? It's not like God created sex, walks away and takes a nap that night, comes back and says, oh, Adam, get off her. That is so gross. Do not do that. (laughs) Right? It's like, man, that's awkward. No, stop. Right? I don't, this is probably not what he said. In all honesty, he probably said amen or that's what I'm talking about. I don't know, right? I mean, that's just a guess, but I mean, in the covenant of marriage, it's an act of worship. So that's probably, he's, been, uh, he's pleased. God is pleased with that. Okay. Just saying, um, <laughs> five minutes in already talking about sex. Dang it. Okay. Um, but then Genesis three, what do you see? Genesis three is the curse. Genesis three is the, the, the sin comes into the world. Genesis three is brokenness. Genesis three is shame, accusation, which by the way, you never see God accuse the uh, Adam and Eve, the humans, as I like to call them, in Genesis 3. You never see him accused, right? In fact, he says, he, he says, Adam, what? Where are you? By the way, God's not an idiot. He's omnipotent. He knows where Adam is. He's asking that because he wants him to come home, okay? It's like, where are you? Come home. Even after they disobeyed the one thing he told them not to do, right? If you want to know, we're never more like Satan than when we accuse. That's the way I'll say it. You want to be like Satan? Accuse people. Eh, that just got really awkward. Okay. Um, it's true. But then you see Genesis 1, you see Genesis 3. Now, wh- where do you start the story? That's a question you have to ask, because if we can be honest, a lot of Christians start with Genesis 3, and that is damnable. That's a harsh word, but it's true. Because why on earth would we start a story where God doesn't start? You're pretty much just cutting him off the knees, right? And by the way, the Genesis 1, 2, and 3, those numbers weren't added till hundreds of years later, which means when you actually start in Genesis 3, before those were there, you're kind of just jumping into the middle of the story, which makes no sense. It makes no sense. So where do you start the story? Because if you start with Genesis 3, then this is what happens. Then sinner, 
The word sinner, you are a sinner, becomes your primary identity or it becomes the identity you say to people. Does that make sense? If you start the story in Genesis 3, then all of a sudden, suddenly, you make this culture where you are a sinner. That is your identity. Here's the truth. It's not. Is it in the scripture? Is sin deep and rich and breaks everything? Yes. But sinner is not your true identity. If you start in Genesis 1, what's your identity? Image of God. The way I like to say it is your primal identity, meaning at the back, at the base fundamentalness of who you are. Image of God. That's who you are. But when you start in Genesis 3, you can't go backwards. When you start in Genesis 1, you can go forwards, meaning you can get to Genesis 3, you can get to sin, you can get to brokenness, right? But when you start in Genesis 3, then you paint this picture of you are a sinner, you are no good. By the way, notice the word sinner a lot of times in the New Testament is kind of this like term that's like not good. Does that make sense? Like in the sense of the culture used it for power, for manipulation. Oh, those are the sinners. Jesus is hanging out with the sinners. That's, that's fascinating, right? Now, I'm not saying, again, like that we're not broken, we are, that affects us deeply, but start in Genesis 1, image of God, and then sin breaks that, but we're still in the image of God. In the same way, if you were to go to a temple, right, and the temple is crumbled on the ground, it's not like it's not still remnants of a temple. Does that make sense? Like, it's not like when sin happened that it changed into an apartment building. I don't know, whatever example you want to use, right? It's still a temple. It's just broken. It's, all, it's pieces on the ground, right? It needs restoration. It needs restoration. So where do you start the story? Because... That is the thing that I think is a little tough to press on in our culture. Why? Because we have these things called the gospel bracelets. You guys ever seen those? Maybe you're wearing them, and that might be really awkward right now. Take your sleeve and go, whoop. No, I'm just joking. But I used to wear them. I used to wear them. I I love them. They're good. They're great tools. Hear me say that. They're great tools. But most gospel bracelets, at least the one I wear, where does it start? What's the first thing on the bracelet? Sin. Are you kidding me? Why on earth do we start the bracelets there? That makes no sense. Genesis 1 and 2, we just skip it. You are a sinner, sin is the problem, and we are going to deal with that. But image of God is our primary identity. But, and again, if you start in Genesis 3, then what happens? You make sin management and payment the big deal. That's a quote from Dallas Willard. He says, when you make Genesis 3 that, sin management becomes the things you are most concerned about. Meaning, if you start in Genesis 3, then your personal sin is the problem. So then Jesus is all about how to fix your personal problem. When you start in Genesis 1, what do you probably get? Again, Genesis 3 happens, but when you start in Genesis 1, then restoration of all things, brokenness of all things actually is what Genesis 3 then turns into, and then Jesus comes and restores all things, not just your your little cute, happy Christian life. All things. He restores all things. I don't know about you, but that's a lot bigger God. Would you, would you say so? That's a lot bigger God, the God of the cosmos, the God of the entire earth, the heaven and the earth. And so where do you start your story? Because he re- restores all things if you start in Genesis 1, and we are image bearers of God. And that's what I want to talk about real quick. So if you have your Bibles, Genesis 1, verse 26 says this, then God said, let us make man, and that's mankind, right? It's, it's, it's like plural saying like all uh, the mankind, not just dude, not just Adam. Let us make dude. That doesn't make sense. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, now this, is, this isn't in my notes, but one thing that's really interesting is notice how the image of God is declared or revealed First in community, not in individuality. Do you see that? That's crazy. Because again, we always like to do that, right? We make image of God all about individualness. You are made in the image of God. You are. But it's even richer than that. Meaning the fullness of who God is is most seen when you're in community with other people. Because that's the first time it's declared. That's the first time it's declared. And so do you read Genesis 1 like that? We are image bearers of the divine. The best example I can think of this, because I think we kind of misunderstand image of God sometimes, is that the best example I've heard is kind of like, it's kind of like an angled mirror, right? Ladies, you probably have mirrors, probably have like 50 of them, let's just be honest. But um, you get a mirror, right? And you angle it, and that is what it means to be a proper image bearer of God. In the same way that, so what I'm trying to say about that is God, right? If God's up here, right, and the mirror's angled, then you are to reflect. If God's coming down on that mirror, where's it go? It goes out, right? So you're supposed to reflect who God is to what? To the world and to the rest of creation. And then it goes reverse as well. 
meaning we're image bearers of God means we're kind of the middlemen. We're the stewards of this whole earth. God made us kind of have dominion over it to reflect to creation who he is and then to take creation and reflect that back to him. So creation with the angled mirror comes in and we are supposed to take that, cultivate, steward, build, use it, and reflect that back up to God as worship. There's this peculiar phrase in almost all of the scripture where it says the people of God are what? A priesthood. Now priests, again, are middlemen. Priests are to take people's worship and sacrifice and offer it up to God in worship. That's what you're supposed to do with creation. You're supposed to take food, art, politics, culture, music, cooking for Pete's sake, whatever it is, take it, cultivate it, reflect it back to God. That's what it means to be an image bearer of God. Do we see that? And honestly, sin is pretty much someone taking a hammer, hitting the mirror, turning it around and saying, damn, I look pretty awesome, don't I? That's pretty much sin. A broken mirror and then looking at yourself. Especially in a broken, broken mirror, let's be honest, you don't look that awesome. I don't look that awesome, right? Even in a, a fixed mirror, I probably don't look that awesome, okay? Right? But that's sin. It's taking the mirror and saying, no, I'm going to take it this way and I'm going to look at myself. Self-worship is pretty much the, the definition of sin. And then one last thing on Genesis before we really get to what I want to chat about is, and this is deeply fascinating, you can take it or you can leave it, but some scholars are led to believe lately, especially with new findings, that according to ancient Near East traditions, which by the way, that's kind of the Bible tradition, like it's not Western, it's not 21st century, it was written a long time ago in the Eastern world. According to ancient Near Eastern traditions, most scholars believe now that if you were to read Genesis 1, well I should say some, not most, there's bajillions of scholars. When you read Genesis 1, it's actually a Hebrew or someone in that ancient Near East tradition would have recognized it as a temple creation text, meaning it followed rhythms and it followed frameworks of similar text on what a temple was supposed to be built like. That's really fascinating. Does that make sense? That's, it follows a framework and it follows a rhythm of what a temple is supposed to be built like. Now that's, that's really interesting. And, and two of the main things that I see that, that, uh, that you see in Genesis 1 to kind of prove that point is in any ancient literature, when a temple was being built, the last thing on the day of work, they would do what? When you build a temple, what's the last thing you do? Kind of the last building thing, the last work thing. You put an image of the God in that temple. Do you not? Uh, you make it carve it out of stone or whatever, bronze, whatever your, tickles your fancy, I don't know. Do your thing, put it in the image. Okay. You put it in there, and that's the last day of work. And then you have an inauguration ceremony after that, which is a day of rest, where the God enters into that temple. Does that sound familiar? Anyone? Anyone? Sounds awfully familiar to me from Genesis 1, right? We are those image bearers put in the temple, and then God on the Sabbath, on the day of rest, floods that place with his presence. But here's what's interesting. Every ancient Near East text that follows that rhythm has a building. Do you see a building in Genesis 1? No. Which is saying what? That the temple is the earth. The entire creation is how God set it up to be. That is where he wants to flood. That is where he wants to infiltrate. That is where he wants to be. Do you see all of the earth as God's? Or do you just see the place as the cross on the top of the brick building as God's? I just don't see that in the scripture, right? And so you see that he wants to, from the get-go, God's goal is always intimacy and dwelling with his people. That's fascinating. From the get-go, that's the whole point of a temple. A temple is to dwell. He wants to dwell with his people. You guys, he wants to dwell with his people. Do you see that? He's always bent on intimacy and bent on being with his people. And then Genesis 3 comes and there's sin and there's brokenness, but he's still dead set on restoring that. And I just want to go real quick over what I covered last year um, in my my four-minute talk in convocation at the last one. Um, You see this idea in Scripture where when you zoom out, This God is becoming awfully more and more intimate every step of history rather than pulling away. Does that make sense? So you see after sin happens, he still wants to dwell with his people. He could have said, oh, screw you, you guys are idiots. Am I allowed to say that here? Okay, but (laughs) that was awkward. He probably could have said something. Um, But then he comes, right, and he doesn't just leave, but he dwells in the tabernacle and then in the temple. He makes himself, I mean, think about that. He humbles himself to brick and mortar into like a building because he wants to dwell with his people. And then how awesome were the Israelites? Just be honest. They weren't that awesome, right? Church people have changed a lot since then. Have they not, right? Okay, they're not that awesome, right? And still, 
He says, I still want to dwell with my people. They disobey, they rebel. So he says, you know what? I even want to get closer to them. I don't want to do it. I'm going to send Jesus. I'm going to send myself in flesh to walk among them. Do you see how intimate that is? For Pete's sake, God is next to us. Next to us. And then Jesus says these really weird things, like in Matthew, where Matthew tries to summarize what Jesus is preaching as. It says, from that time he went preaching the gospel, saying, repent, what? The kingdom of heaven is three people? Okay, at hand, near, depending on your translation, whatever. The kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is so weird. That's not the gospel we preach. Our gospel would say, repent, the kingdom of heaven is really, really, really far away. You raise your hand, you can go there when you die. Does anyone see that in the scripture? Anyone? I, I don't. I just flat, flat out don't. I see him saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. And, and again, in, in the Greek, that's almost saying like it's as close as the breath is to your body. Like when you breathe, right, it's right there. The kingdom of heaven is there, meaning he's coming here. He's coming here. His goal, his point is to come here, to have a place where his kingdom, his rule, his reign is restored at last. I heard a pastor say that one of the most awkward times in a Christian's life will be when they die, right, at the end of time, and they're going up, and then Jesus is coming down, and he's going to go, where are you going? I'm going down, so you can have fun up there in the clouds, but I'm coming down, right? Everything about the scripture is descent. Everything. Closer, 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 closer. I'm coming down, I'm coming down, I'm coming down. I'm bringing my rule and my reign on people until he gets closer and closer. And then finally, are we nice to Jesus when he comes? No. We kill him. We kill him. Kind of blew that one, right? We kill him. And then instead, he probably could have given us the middle finger or something on that one. Dang it, I shouldn't use that example either. But he, he, that's a really bad visual. Do not, do not think that one. Okay. But dang it, I got one more strike left and I'm done. Okay. Comes down, right? And we kill him, and instead, when he could have literally said that, like, hey, I don't want you, whatever, you guys just keep pretty much being idiots to me, he says, no, I actually want to get closer. I want to give them the power of the Holy Spirit to dwell inside them. It doesn't get much more intimate than that. And the power of the Spirit dwells in us to be on our journey through the wilderness until we get to the end of time, where it says we don't even need the sun, because his glory is going to shine so bright. There's this prophecy in Isaiah 11, where it says, at the end of time, God's glory will fill the earth the same way that the water covers the sea. That is crazy. Water is sea. Am I correct? So like the way water covers the sea, like that just absolutely blows my mind. Okay? That's how intimate he wants to be. His glory wants to cover the earth, the earth, here. Not some place in the sky with clouds and harps and babies and wings. That is so weird, by the way. Like when I see paintings of that, like with babies and wings, I'm like, if I saw that in real life, I would run. <laughs> like why is that normal? Right? And why is it always babies, right? It's just weird, and they have wings. I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. But you don't see that. The glory will cover the earth in the same way the water covers the sea. Do you believe in that, Jesus? Do you believe in that, God? Are you joining him in coming down, if that makes sense? Are you allowing your life to be under the kingdom and rule of God and then saying, I'm going to let everything that I touch be affected in that same way. I'm going to bring it under the rule and reign of who God is. Jesus is king, and that's it. Jesus is king. That is the better gospel, I think, than some of our Americanized gospels. When I read the scripture, I see, Jesus is Lord, repent. I don't, I don't hear that very often in the 21st century. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is, in, is king. But the problem we have with that, though, is because we, in American Christianity, we don't want intimacy, we want right answers. Is that you? Let's just be honest, this might get awkward, but where more than an actual Christian college is that true? I mean, where more is it true than a place where you're studying to have the right answers? That's fine. Education's good, right? Right? To have the right answers. But you miss out on the fact that God wants intimacy. God is actually after intimacy. But here's a question. What was the primal sin? We didn't read it, but in Genesis 1, what was the first sin? What was the tree called that they ate? Knowledge of good and evil. Now, that's, that's interesting. The first sin was them trying to attain the knowledge of good and evil. Now here's the truth. You don't need God if you have the right answers. Does that make sense? But you do need God to de for dependency and intimacy. You can't have dependency and, in dependency and intimacy without God because you have to lean on him. But you can have the right answers without God. They were trying to be autonomous in Genesis 1. They were trying to say, I am king, I am Lord, I know what's right, and I know what's wrong. But here's the thing. If they wouldn't have ate from that tree, then they would have had to live in perpetual dependency on God because only he knows the difference between right and wrong. Does that make sense? 
Meaning, God wants to get to you to a place where you want to depend on him so much that by the power of the Spirit, he shows you and nudges you on what is right and what's wrong in the moment. And that's called the power of the Spirit. But we don't really want that. We just want the textbook answer and then just go ahead and live without Jesus. Right? And I just, I just find that f- intriguing because I just don't see that in the Scripture. And then the example I think of is, imagine, like God always uses the example of a marriage, does he not, in the, in the New Testament or the Old Testament for that matter, as one of the biggest, biggest examples of us and him. Now, what's really crazy about that is, man, marriage is about as intimate as it gets. Would you agree? Marriage is about as intimate as it gets. You know the person fully. You see all that they are. They're transparent with you, right? Now, imagine if when I got married, actually, I'm coming up on my one-year one year anniversary next week. Imagine last year when I got married. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I made it one year. Woo! Alyssa, I love you. I love you. Um, <clears throat> One year, hopefully 97 to go. Man, that'd be really old. Never mind. But, no, I mean, I want to stay married that long. One of my goals is to get on the front of the Smucker's Jam, like, things on Today Show. You guys ever seen that? Where when you live past 100, they put you on... Okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> I, only got a, I only got 10 minutes. Okay, let's go. Um, here's the thing, though. Imagine a year ago when I got married to Alyssa, and I go to the altar, like, did I marry her, or did I marry the institution of marriage? Does that make sense? I know it's kind of a weird way to say it. Who did I marry? I married her. I married Alyssa. I married a person. I didn't marry marriage. That is stupid. Let's be honest, that's the game we play. We marry Christianity, we marry the institution, there's no Jesus at the altar. No Jesus, right? That's the difference. Now here's the thing. Now that example, now that example goes both ways for a few reasons. One, it also is a good example that you still need the institution. A lot of people say, oh, just give me Jesus. He's my BFF and my homeboy, and I'm not going to go to church. You're an idiot too. Okay, can I just be honest? Right? Because, here, hear me out. Hear me out. Now, you're not an idiot. I love you. You're so cute and precious. Okay. But, um, <laughs> but like when I married Alyssa, it was still within the institution of marriage. Does that make sense? Like, it's still marriage, it's still the institution, there's still boundaries, there's still rules, there's still things surrounding us, but the bullseye, the thing at the center is me and Alyssa in intimacy with one another, growing on a journey together. That's Christianity. You're in the institution of Christianity. There is the church, there is the body, there is rules, there is boundaries. Jesus is at the center. If he's not at the center, that looks weird. That's what a lot of us do. We just marry marriage. And like, that is so weird. So ask yourself, do you marry marriage? Have you literally just married an institution, you have boundaries and rules, and there's no intimacy with your creator? Question, do you believe God wants to constantly bring you into deeper intimacy? And then question two, do you let him? Now here's the hard part, which I think I mentioned last talk as well. Intimacy comes at a cost, and that cost is vulnerability. You can't get intimate with someone, and that just means be fully known. That's all it means. I'm not trying to, you know, get all awkward and romantic with God. It just means to be fully known. You can't get that unless you're vulnerable, unless you're honest, unless you're transparent, unless you take off the mask. And I know there's people in here that have dark stuff, right? Maybe sexual abuse, maybe pain, maybe uh, uh, beatings from parents, whatever it is. I know there's dark stuff in here, broken relationships. And a lot of those I'm speaking out of my own life, right? And I know you've never been honest with anyone, but I promise you joy is at stake if you'll just take off the mask. It's hard, it's real, real hard. But there's nothing better than to be fully known. You can't be fully loved unless you're fully known. So I'm asking you, take off the mask because God is going somewhere and he wants to grow with you in intimacy. But a lot of us don't. We're just stuck in this Torah-like obedience. And this will be the last example before I close with a story. And the Torah, the first five books of the Bible are called what? Torah, right? Instruction, whatever you want to call them, okay? The Bible starts there. Now, does it end with Torah? No. Meaning, God's going somewhere. There's different journeys, there's different ways of God revealing himself. He's going somewhere, he's on a journey. First of all, that's really fascinating. Think about that, God's going somewhere. Like I used, like in all honesty, like the first three years of uh, like me following Jesus, like he's symbolically, he's on the throne, like he's king, but I always had this vision of God literally just sitting on the throne. Like, man, does he do anything, right? He's moving, he's working, he's doing stuff. And he's on the throne because he's king, but again, that's more for the fact that he's king. But... A lot of us are stuck in this Torah obedience, meaning we're kind of stuck in the Old Testament way of looking at things, but God is on a journey and he wants to bring us into deep, deeper intimacy, but we let the Torah, we let the law self-terminate on itself and try to earn our salvation or try to just stare at it to be good enough. Now, this is the example I use. The Torah is good because there's another kind of frame of Christianity that just says, oh, the law is bad and blah, blah, blah. That's, that's just not right. 
God would never give us anything that's not good. Ever. It's actually for your joy. The law is a beautiful way to show. This is the way and the rhythms I've lined up the universe to work. It's so good. But here's the thing. The law is to bring us into deeper intimacy. Here's the example I'll give. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, my mom always had like that one thing that she would like kind of like, uh, uh, what's the word? Like uh, when she tries to get me to do something. Uh, like, what was it? Chore. Yeah, chore. She like, she would, yeah. So I was, yeah, there we go. When I was trying to do chores, thank you. Woo. Um, she would always like say, she would hold something out to do the chore, right? Like, hey, if you, if you clean your room, I'll give you a Skittle. One? Really? Okay. Um, <laughs> Whatever it is, pick it. She'll give me a Skittle or she'll give me a toy or something like that. When I, or, or if you're really young, you know, it's like when kids are learning potty training. Oh, you go pee-pee and I'll give you a little snicker or something. I don't know. It's like, it's so weird, right? But it's kind of normal. Let's be honest. That happens when the kids are really young, right? Um, but now here's a question. If you go home, like you probably just went home on fall break. If you go home on fall break and you walk in the door <laughs> and you're like 18 years old, your mom goes, hey, little Johnny, you go pee-pee. I'll give you a Snickers. What? Mom, that is awkward and weird. You should get arrested for that, right? <laughs> well, why is that not normal then? Because you're supposed to be growing in intimacy. You don't really, you don't need that anymore. Because the law now is love and you want to obey her because you love her. Do you see what I'm saying there? He wants to bring you into deeper intimacy, meaning he wants to bring you and kind of funnel in the Torah obedience towards deeper intimacy. There comes a point where you just love Jesus, or you do things because you just love Jesus. And you know he's good, and you know you can trust him. And God is pleased with that. You're not doing it out of fear. You're not doing it for a skittle. You're doing it because you love him. That's where he wants to get you. That's where he wants to get you. And I'm not sure we know that. And so I'll end with this story. This is a story of a guy named Dimitri. And this story really kind of actually changed my life. It's from a book called Insanity of God. Has anyone heard of that book? Great book. Great book. Really, seriously, go read it. Like if I had three, like if I could pick a book to give someone, that's the book. It's amazing. It's a lot about it. It's about the persecuted church. And there's this guy named Dimitri. There's a story in the book about a guy named Dimitri who kind of lived in kind of communist Russia during the time of persecution and stuff like that. And he started following Jesus, right, in communist Russia. Like it's dangerous, right? And so what's he do? He holds a public Bible study because that's what you do in communist Russia when you get saved. You hold a public Bible study, right? So he does it, and it starts flourishing. People start coming, one people, two people, three people, four people. And I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it started growing so much to the point it got to like 50 people. The authorities started noticing he got fired from his job. And then one week, all of a sudden, they come in, they bust through the door. They pretty much like put the gun up to his neck or something like that. I read it last year, so it might, yeah. But um, no, they put the gun up against his neck, and they say something to the effect of, you know, you need to stop. This is illegal. If you do this one more time, if you don't kind of split the group and stop hosting a public Bible study, we'll take you to jail. We'll kill you. Stuff like that. We'll put your, 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 your wife and your kid in prison. And of course, oh, this is what, I almost forgot this part too. And so when they're about to walk out the door, this is what's really fascinating. When they're walking out the door, this old little grandma kind of shuffles over. She goes, rrr, 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 right? Shuffles towards the door. She's probably like four feet tall. That's just the vision I got when I was reading it. And she pokes the guy in the chest and says, you just touched a man of God. You won't live another week to speak about it. I'm like, Dang, that grandma's a boss, right? <laughs> but, um, I mean, I don't know if I want that as my grandma or my private security detail. But she, she does that, and, and then they leave. Guess what? Like two or three days later, the guards die. They straight up die. Crazy, right? And because of that, because of that, I mean, it's not even the best part. Because of that, the Bible study grows by like double the next week. And so, again, it's just huge. People are packed in, and then the authorities come in and did exactly what they say. They take him to jail. They take him to jail. And, it, and we're not talking American prison where you get to like watch TV and play pool. We're like, he was the only Christian, it says, in that prison. It was so bad that prisoners would actually like throw feces on him. They would like, the guards would actually put that on bread and have him eat it. Like just nasty, gross stuff. And he was in there for, I think, somewhere around like 17 years. And every day since the day he got there, because he hadn't been following Jesus that long, he would get up in the morning and he would sing one worship song that he had memorized or had from, or sing worship songs that he had kind of learned since he started following Jesus. And he would just sing him every morning. It was during that morning people would throw at him and do all stuff like that. But he'd do it faithfully every morning because that was how he wanted to worship God, let people know he was a follower of the King Jesus. And so he'd do that year after year, year after year. And then finally he just kind of broke. Finally he broke. Finally they, they would come in all the time and they would say, hey, if you just sign this card, right, saying that you're not a Christian, right, then we'll let you go. Which is fascinating because we do the opposite. Sign this card, say you are a Christian. They said sign this card, say you're not a Christian. We'll let you go. We'll let you go. And he finally, sooner or later, broke. He says, hey, bring it back in the morning, and I will. Right? And so, because he, he just couldn't take anymore. The pain, the malnourishment, the years. And I think they had said that they killed his wife and stuff like that. And so they come in the morning. But in that night, right, God gave him a vision of his 
wife and his son still alive, praying for him at that exact moment, the time where the dad broke. The wife and the son are praying for him, saying, God, we intercede for him, we love him, hold strong. You know, he, you are king, show him that you are good, right? And so then they come in in the morning because he got that vision. He kind of totally recants, says, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not recanting, I'm not signing that paper. And they say, fine, we're kind of done with you. We're going to take you out and kill you. And so then they go out and they start taking him to the center square to execute him. And right when they're about to kind of walk him out there, in unison, all like 1,500 other prisoners in that prison stand up against the window, go up against the window, and all in unison start singing the one worship song he'd been singing every morning since he got there. I mean, how crazy is that? And because of the moment was so palpable, so beautiful, and so just crazy, right, of God's presence and spirit, they pretty much just let go of him and they said, who are you? And he said, I'm a child of the king and Jesus is his name. And they said, well, we don't want anything to do with you anymore. You're weird. Get out of here, right? And then a couple of weeks later, they let him go. And I was like, I remember reading that story. And that's the one thing I want you to take from that story. I remember reading that story and say, oh my goodness, what got him through? First of all, I like it because he wasn't perfect. He did break, but man, he knew Jesus and he loved him and he got him through. But what got him through? Did he get through that because someone told him not to drink beer and not to have tattoos and not to dance, right? Uh, the, the, the Christian school I went to freshman year, you couldn't dance. I don't know about you guys, but I was just making a reference to my old school. Okay. Um, right? But no. Now, I'm not saying don't, hey man, have convictions on those things, by the way, too. Let me say that. I'm just saying, was that the motivation? Was that the essence? No. Right? What was it? Right? Was it that, man, if he got out, God would give him a Bentley and a nice house? No. The thing was the intimacy with his creator. He already had what he needed in prison. The joy was what he already had, and that is God himself. And so that is what I want you to leave with you guys with, is do you have that strength of faith? Do you guys have that intimacy with your creator? I want to end with one thing. If you can stand with me real quick, everyone just stand with me. I want to read. Wow, that's loud when you guys stand. Okay. As we go out, I want to read just a few verses from Revelation 21, and I want you to close your eyes. I'm not going to get all crazy spiritual and play some piano and all that stuff. Just close your eyes for me. Just close them. Okay. And the only reason I ask you to do that is because we visualize better with eyes closed. That's all I want you to visualize. Okay. And I'm going to read five verses from Revelation 21 about new heavens, new earth. And when I'm reading it, I want you just to visualize it. Have some imagination for Pete's sake. Our dad is the creator, is he not? Vision. Have some vision. Think about it. And when, I, and when I read it, I want you to say, man, is that where we're going? Is that where I'm going? Is that my goal? And so I want to read this and then I'll pray for us. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. There's intimacy there. Verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for today. You are so good. Your grace is so good. Let us get caught up in the greatest story of all time. You are the creator. You are the writer. And we are just people in that play. We love you. Let us point to you as the main character. Name me pray. Amen.